Good morning. Can everybody hear me? It sounds like there's a good echo here. Okay. Well, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank Wynne Scott and the AA for their kind invitation to speak. Um, unfortunately, because of the time constraint, I didn't put together a presentation, and if I have to start showing you sources, that will burn up the time. Uh, but I hope I'm going to have enough time to make a couple of salient points as to why I believe that the Kurgan style theories arguing for a recent breakup of Indo-European languages are incoherent and untenable. Um, and I should perhaps point out that I'm representing ASLIP, which stands for the association of, is that better if I stand closer to the microphone? Or? Okay, right, okay. Uh, ASLIP is the Association for the Study of Language in Prehistory, based in Harvard, which publishes the annual review, uh, Mother Tongue. Uh, we've got about 150 members committed to proving that we can demonstrate the existence of long-range linguistic relationships going very deep into prehistory, even back to uh, proto-sapiens. Um, now, most linguists regard the origin of language as a kind of taboo subject, um, and I, my background is actually in biology and genetics, and I thought, which is steeped in evolutionary uh, an evolutionary approach and has been all the way since Darwin. Uh, so I find this rather bizarre. But the few of them who do occupy themselves with the field of paleolinguistics have been very hostile, and actually I can use the word defamatory. And I'm talking about figures like uh, Donald Ringe and Lyle Campbell, who seem to see themselves as the carriers of a sacred torch of Indo-European exceptionalism, whose mission in life is to deny all external linguistic relations of, of this family, pretty much. They, they, they do give a little bit of concession to possible relationships with Uralic, but that's about it. And they've mainly directed their um, criticism against, sorry, uh, uh, yep, sorry. Um, uh, now, uh, as you're no doubt also aware, while Indo-European is merely a very widespread language family, since the 19th century there's been a tendency to ethnicize it, assuming that there was an original Indo-European people with a particular religion or ideology or form of social organization, um, often with the subtext going back into the you know, uh, 19th and uh, early 20th century that they were superior to other peoples and the consensus for its homeland has shifted from Central Asia in the 19th century to Northern Germany now we're going back to the Pontic Steppes with the work of uh, Gordon Child and Maria Gimbutas and we now seem to have a group of people who I'm going to call the Kurganistas who are trying to promote the, trying to revive the Kurgan theory of the late Bronze Age dispersal from the Ukrainian steppes and this is notably uh, David Anthony in his book The Horse, the Wheel and Language uh, and they've been backed up by Martin Lewis and Asya Pereltzweig, I'm going to call them LMP, uh, of Stanford. Um, they published a book in 2015, The Indo-European Controversy. Um, they've mainly been directing their criticism against Colin Renfrew who's argued from a, for a Neolithic dispersal from Anatolia um, and his model received support from uh, a phylogenetic perspective from Quentin Atkinson and Russell, Russell Gray, uh, and basically um, Lewis and Pereltzweig uh, launched a bilious attack on this method with some justification uh, on the ground that um, their model was poorly characterized, it was overly mathematical, and it just didn't fit the empirical fact. Uh, I would agree with that, but I think that what they put in its place is even worse. Um, and since you can no longer get away with an explanation of Indo-European expansion based on manifest destiny or uh, racial superiority. You have to have a, a killer app, a, a piece of a world-beating piece of technology, which obviously in Renfrew's case is, is farming. But in the case of the Kurganistas, it's wheeled vehicles. Um, so, according to Anthony, to quote from his front cover, the front cover is a book. Bronze Age riders from the Asian Eurasian steppes who shape how they shaped the world. Um, they had the kind of the sports cars of the of the Bronze Age, which uh, overawed all of the the sedentary agricultural people um, and gradually spread. And there's just one slight problem with this, in that it's increasingly apparent that the adjacent cultures already had wheels. And this is a point which uh, Jean-Paul de Moule po points out in his book that. Um, as far as the cultures to the west, the Cucuteni and the Tripoli cultures. But um, actually, 
the first uh, wheel and wagon technology appears to the east in the Mycop culture of the Northern Caucasus. Um, and uh, for anyone who wants to look into this in more detail, there's an excellent collection called Rad und Wagen, uh, which gives a comprehensive survey of, um, of, uh, of wheel technologies. So um, Mycop, I think, is a case in point because it's, a ca it, it's elite had grown rich uh, supplying probably pre precious stones and minerals to the states of Mesopotamia, mainly Uruk. And uh, this civilization lasted for about 500 years, uh, from 3700 BCE to 3200 BCE before it collapsed. And it was only right at the end of this civilization that you start to see the spread of uh, wagons onto, uh, onto the steppes. Um, so uh, if as Anthony does, he dogmatically insists that it's the wheeled vehicle which is the 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 the, uh, the vector for the spread of Indo-European languages into uh, into Europe. This process can't really start before right at the end of the fourth millennium. Um, now, uh, it's very clear where the words for wheel come from in Indo-European. There's a root quell or quell, uh, which means to turn or to go round. And this is reduplicated in Greek as kuklos, uh, huechlos in Germanic, which gives us wheel in English, chakra in Indo-Aryan, kukal in Tocharian. But we also find it without reduplication. Uh, so Slav in the Slav languages, uh, in Russian say kolo, in Latin we've got kolos. So uh, the meaning is either to go round or to go round and round. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, Perlzweig and Lewis, uh, they base their entire arguments on an unpublished, I note, note the word unpublished, uh, study from 2006 by Donald Ringe, who claims that this reduplication is so rare that it could only have happened once, and obviously this is a piece of Indo-European intellectual property. Now, uh, if you actually look at the comparative evidence, which is quoted by Gram Krelidzi and Ivanov, uh, you can see that this is nonsense. And in fact, uh, just to give you a quick quote, they say, for the typology of reduplication in the formation of the term for wheel and wheeled wagon, look at Georgian burbal, circle wheel from burbar, Hebrew gilgal, galgal, wheel, Aramaic galgal, wheel, Georgian gorgal, wheeled circle, Sumerian gigir, war chariot. Uh, the phonetic similarity of the Semitic and Indo-European forms is striking. Sumerian gigir is phonetically not far removed from these forms, which points to lexical, historical lexical connections. Um, now, uh, Anthony then goes on to build this theory of expansion of Indo-European on a series of words which, according to him, uh, conclusively prove that the Indo-Europeans own the intellectual property to wheels and wagons. So uh, they've got the word for a yoke, yugum in Latin, yuga in Sanskrit, which is derived from words which mean to unite, bind, join. Uh, according to them, this couldn't possibly have anything to do with the Sumerian word for yoke or bind, which is ugug, yugum, ugug. Uh, we've also got a, uh, zugon in Greek. Uh, we've also, there's a word in Akkadian, zunku, which means to bind, to subject to the yoke. Uh, and then obviously in Indo-European, uh, we actually have multiple roots, uh, words, uh, roots for, for, um, uh, for a wheel. So we've got rota in Latin, which you get rad in German, rata meaning a charity in Sanskrit. And this is identified as coming from a word meaning to run. Uh, sans uh, sorry, Semitic words for to run, well, we've got redu in, in uh, Akkadian. In Hebrew, he's running hurats, rats, rata, uh, obviously ob nothing to do with each other because they're so uh, phonetically distinctive. Uh, so, um, in fact, pretty much most of the words which he cites as um, confirming the Indo-European nature of the word wheel have, have cognates in Sigmatic. And actually, uh, one, of the, one of my research areas is the Italian linguist uh, Alfredo Trombetti, in 1915, he showed that there was a root qual, which means to turn, and by extension, wheel or round object. Uh, he showed that this root was present from all the way from West Africa to Siberia. Uh, in fact, this is a huge family of related words, which I, if I had time, I'd show you. 
which also we also find in cropping up repeatedly in words for worm, knee, guts are all sort of curved things. Uh, so, uh, and Anthony is actually completely silent on this, despite the fact that he puts Gamkrelidze and Ivanov into his bibliography. Uh, Mallory also mentions this. Uh, so it becomes clear that he doesn't believe in reading his own bibliography. Uh, but he's defended by um, Perold Zweig and Lewis on the basis of this unpublished study by Ringe, no, unpublished, which was still not in the public domain after 11 years, and they just dismiss any notion of borrowings. Um, so uh, even going to, even specifying what they call a wheel line, 3500 BC, uh, before which there could have been no dissemination of Indo-European languages. And uh, this um, falls straight into a vicious circle of reasoning, uh, according to which uh, a late breakup for Indo-European implies hyper-accelerated linguistic change, which in turn implies a late breakup date. Uh, the Italian linguist Mario Alenese used a rather, I think, a great term. He's called this linguistic creationism. Um, and so Anthony has got Proto-Indo-European differentiating into Italic, Germanic in a few hundred years. Uh, unfortunately, this means that his model can't uh, account for Greek, which appears in exactly the wrong place to fit his model. Or I'll, I'll just quote him here. Uh, the people who imported Greek or Proto-Greek into Greece might have moved several times, perhaps by sea, from the western Pontic steppes to southeastern Europe to western Anatolia to Greece, making their trail hard to find. Uh, the EHS, what do you call 2-3 transition, about 2400 to 2200 BC, has long been seen as a time of radical change in Greece when new people might have arrived. But the resolution of this problem is outside the scope of his book. So, you know, uh, this is nonsense. Uh, you know, he's launching this model, but then he can't even explain how Greek gets to Greece and then says, oh, well, actually, that's not something I need to discuss. Um, now, uh, what I s the other thing is it's equally deficient on explanations about how Germanic got to the Germanic area. He just says, oh, there's a group of pastoralists moving up the Danube in the right direction, so they, they, pr they presumably got there in the end. Um, now, the odd man, how are we doing for time? Okay. The odd man out in the Indo-European family is Anatolian, which, according to Antony, is seriously deficient in wheel vocabulary. Indeed, uh, according to him, the Proto-Hittites fled the Pontic steppes via the Balkans for a, a wheel-free space in Anatolia, except that they do actually have a word for wheel, hurki, which looks suspiciously like a borrowing from the Semitic root gur, which, by the way, is also borrowed into Basque as Gurdi, uh, and that's not exactly what you'd expect from a, a, a Kurgan theory. Uh, the Hittites also used the Samirogram for chariot, so we don't know how it, what the actual phonetics was. Um, and in fact, uh, Gamkrelidze and Ivanov, to quote them again, uh, they say, for a number of early Indo-European traditions, there's a characteristic ritual and mythological role for the wheel and its deification as a symbol of the sun, which is worshipped as a deity. The ritual symbolism of the, of the wheel is quite clear in old Hittite tradition. So obviously the Hittites had no knowledge of wheels or, or anything. Um, now, when we lift the veil on Indo-European languages only a few centuries later, uh, we find that the languages we can observe, uh, Hittite, Greek, arguably Indo-Aryan, are already fully differentiated and identifiable in their current form and are all located in areas close to the homelands which can be identified for them in historic times. Now, nor are there any cases of any brand new but deeply differentiated uh, branches of Indo-European emerging over the last 3,000 years. In fact, the oldest observable branch, Hittite, is actually the most aberrant. Um, now, my own work, which unfortunately I don't have time to cite, has been devoted to show how conservative these daughter families are Notably, that lexical replacement occurs almost entirely through internal borrowing and tends to cluster at the start of the development of a daughter language and it isn't a smooth and continuous process. Um, I think I've... Uh, sorry, I've just got lost here. Um, uh, yeah, so this is a pretty much a blatant violation of the 
of what Donald Ringe has termed the uniformitarian principle, which says that the uh, if you have a period which you can't observe, the behaviour must be the same as the period which you can observe. Um, and all that um, Perold, Zweig and Lewis do is to try and prop up this edifice by quoting from Andrew Garrett's work, who basically has a very selective interpretation of the evidence. He just points to a, a small number of highly conserved morphological features uh, between a hypothetical reconstruction of Proto-Indo-European um, and the early daughter languages, for example, the endings of the present tense of the verb in Hittite and Sanskrit and, and Greek. Um, but this is actually self-contradictory uh, firstly, because it argues for a low breakup date based on morphological similarities between Hittite, which separates at an early stage, and other Indo European languages. Um, and it still fails to explain the extensive lexical differences between the daughter families of Indo European. Um, just as a last point, um, I think the linguistic evidence does show that men spoke about things that were round or went round long before any wagon appeared on the Pontic steppes. Uh, indeed, there's no reason why the extensive shared vocabulary for such concepts shouldn't date back to the Paleolithic. Now, while this notion may seem too far removed from the current paradigm to be credible, uh, it seems to me that any explanation of the diffusion of Indo-European based on wheeled technology must account for such phenomena as grooved tracks on the moors of northern Germany dating back to 4600 BC, stone wheels in Malta and Sicily from the 5th millennium BC, and the advent of uh, wheel-spun pottery in Iraq and also in Pakistan, uh, again, uh, late 6th, probably certainly mid-5th uh, millennium BC, uh, not to mention the evidence of the, uh, the, the slow wheel or the tournette goes back probably 500, 600 years earlier to the, uh, I think it's the late Samara period, and so uh, this idea that Proto-Indo-European remained unified until right at the end of the uh, fourth millennium needs a, a radical revision. Um, I haven't had a chance really to talk about the Paleolithic continuity theory, but you know, I think a first step is really to get rid of this low breakup date. I think that's really what I had to say, so thank you very much. Thank you.